So when was the last time that you had cash on you? Or when was the last time you paid for something in cash? Now for me, I don't use cash that often at all. One of the only times was like yesterday when I went to get my hair cut. Now they only accept cash there, costs 11 quid. So I got 20 pound note out, gave him 13 because I think he does a good job. And then I've got seven pound on me that lasts me, I don't know, about a week, buy a coffee or an energy drink before work with it, maybe a couple of scratch cards, chuck a quid into the bowl under my table, find it a month later, I'm buzzing. But that's it really, so not often at all. Also around here, taxis don't uh, accept card yet. So when I'm in a taxi, I get cash out, but that's kind of like an immediate transfer of money. Um, some of the restaurants that I go to are cash only. But yeah, that's it, not often at all. And second question, when was the last time you went inside a bank? Now for me, I honestly don't think I've been inside a bank since about 2017. So it doesn't help that the people that I bank with they don't have a branch close to me at all. So it's an absolute trek to go there. So that's one reason. Another reason is online banking these days is pretty easy. It's pretty simple. Don't seem to have that many issues with it, apart from when I forget my password. Uh, and it takes me about a week to log back in. But yeah, online banking is pretty simple. It's pretty effective, it works. But yeah, let me know the answer to those questions. When was the last time you paid for something in cash? And when was the last time you went inside a bank? Let me know. I'm interested to hear. So I work in customer facing hospitality. So I do handle cash and see cash on a regular basis. But I bet there's a lot of you that don't even handle or see cash at all anymore. Just not part of your lifestyle. So yeah, in doing preparation for this film, I thought it was just gonna be about me wandering around my local area, looking at what all the banks have turned into, looking where all the cash machines have gone. And I thought that might be interesting because it's probably the same in your town. All around the United Kingdom, it's probably the same with banks disappearing and cash machines going. So I thought that might be quite interesting to, uh, to see. But I realized it's actually gonna be about the importance of cash and how a cashless society is a really bad thing and kind of changing that narrative of a cashless society and what it means. So yeah, in the planning for this film, I spoke to a lot of people on both sides of the fence. I spoke to people who, and read a lot from people who hate cash, who just are done with it, have find absolutely no need for it, um, and yeah, heard from their perspective of that, we just don't need it anymore. Digital currency is far better. So yeah, I also heard a lot from the complete other side of that, the people who are completely against a cashless society. And I was really interested in that, but it can quickly on that side fall into sort of conspiracy theory. And I really wanted just some facts and some, some evidence to uh, support that. But a lot of the time it just fell on this sort of shadowy elite that were uh, controlling everything. And I just don't really buy that. I was firmly in the middle. I don't use cash that often. So I thought, is a cashless society really gonna be that much of a bad thing? Is it gonna affect me that much? I was also put off a bit from that sort of heavy conspiracy theory side, which seems kind of forceful. So that made me kind of think, oh, where, where am I? Where do I stand on this? But ultimately, after doing my research, I've realized that a cashless society is a terrible thing and we do need to hang on to cash. So I'm going to attempt for this film to not fall into the world of conspiracy theory because as I say that can be kind of off-putting in a way, like I was myself. I'm going to kind of keep it just to the facts and the evidence and hopefully relay to you some of the information which, which made me change my mind about why a cashless society is a bad thing and uh, why it's important to hang on to cash. So we used to trade in gold and then we traded in money which was backed by gold and then we traded in money which was backed by nothing and now we trade in virtual money, which is backed by virtual nothing. And this in part has given rise to these sort of cryptocurrencies and other forms of digital wealth, which kind of exist as a counterculture to actual money and to the actual organizations which, which control money. So if virtual money is backed by nothing, then what's stopping people from coming up with their own versions of currency and trading? Now the central banks don't like this idea. They want everyone to believe in their idea of money. They being the private banking sector, such as your Lloyds, your HSBC, your NatWest, your Visa, your PayPal, all of these things that control how we spend our money, how we access our money. So an example, if you go and buy a can of Coke, and this can of Coke costs a pound, and you go in, you've got your pound coin, you hand your pound coin over, the merchant gets the pound coin, you get your can of Coke, transaction done. Now with virtual payments, with your phone, be it your watch, I can pay with my uh, smartwatch, you can pay with anything these days. What happens is, when you tap your card or whatever it is, essentially Visa or 
uh, MasterCard or whoever it is, tells your bank to send that payment to the other bank. And for this, they charge a small transaction fee. So say that transaction fee is 1%. So you've paid for your can of Coke, you've paid a pound, the merchant has received 99p, and the banking company Visa or whatever have received a penny. Not that much, that's fine. But in a cashless society, these banking companies, these big tech companies who, who control those transactions have all the power. They control it. We have no say on what charges they put on. That 1% charge on that can of Coke might suddenly become a 10% charge. So you go pay for your can of Coke now, you pay a pound, the merchant gets 90p, and then the banking company gets 10p. Now, later on, the merchant are gonna think, I don't wanna take on this, uh, this extra cost that I'm having to pay this banking company. So then they'll put it back onto the product. So then you go to buy a can of Coke, it costs one pound 10. And if you think this is unlikely, just look at your energy bills at the moment. Look at how much they are costing. It is ludicrous and they shouldn't be that much. They really shouldn't be that much. When you have no control of what people can charge, they will charge what they want. They really will. All they care about is profit and shareholder stakes. That's it. If we give up cash completely, we no longer have control of paying for things in the way we want to pay for things. And they can charge us whatever they want for, tr for transactions. And it's already happening. It really is. You only need to look at certain different things like PayPal or Apple Pay. And the transaction fees are different on different products and different services. So yeah, once we give up cash and we go fully digital, it will literally become expensive to own cash. It will become expensive to use our cash. You already see it at a lot of cash machines that still exist now. They say, this cash machine charges two pounds. You're paying to have your own cash. It's your cash and you have to pay to get it. So with cash or just the ability to access cash, it keeps the power with the consumer throughout transactions. Now, if we give up that, the power does end up with these big tech corporations and banks. And this is where it's not conspiracy. It's not some conspiracy theory of some shadowy elite that uh, are all sitting together in one room controlling everything. It's a lot worse than that. It's big tech corporations, big banks fighting against each other for profits and market share. That's a lot scarier than some conspiracy theory of who's, who's controlling it. Right, and I'm in the center of town now and the first, well, it's not a bank anymore, it's a restaurant, but it's just coming up down here. So I'll show you. So here we have it, the first old bank, which is now a restaurant and a bar called The Vault. Maybe just a bar called The Vault. Aptly named The Vault, because it used to be a bank. And there used to be a cash machine just in the front as well. I think it's gone, well, it's definitely gone. Yeah, there was a cash machine here as well somewhere. So that's gone, so that's the first one. This used to be the NatWest Bank. It closed in 2016, this one, NatWest. And NatWest claim on their website to be a relationship bank for a digital world. That's what they are now. A relationship bank for a digital world. Interestingly, in 2021, NatWest got convicted of money laundering and they currently have on Trustpilot a review of 1.4 out of five stars, which I don't normally trust uh, Trustpilot reviews because I know you can just buy them and stuff. But normally, if the reviews are bad, they're actually more accurate. It's when someone's got loads of good reviews that you need to start worrying. And here as well is another cash machine that's gone, closed down. Look at that, just a big metal plate over it. And I remember that's, that must have shut down pretty recently because I used to live in one of these flats up there, not even that long ago. And I remember that that was open then. Uh, you could use that cash machine then. And when you've got access to a cash machine, you use it. When there's a cash machine that's near you, it's just easy to have cash on you. Um, yeah, but that's the first cash machine that's gone. Sorry, second cash machine. There was another one on the front where Nat West was. And then round here as well, is the other big bank that closed down. It was the Lloyds Bank, which again has been turned into a bar restaurant with another name that uh, holds some memory of what it once was. Yeah, that's named Coin, not Cohen. Coin. And the cash machine used to be right on the front here. And I actually used to just live down that street as well at some point. I've lived all over in Hebden. But yeah, this was the Lloyds Bank, which I think shut down in 2019. I think this was the last one to shut down. Shady bankers though. I remember 
on my, uh, I, I took a year out before going to university. Um, when, I was about eight, when I was 18, I took a year out and uh, I was on the dole at the time. And I remember I, uh, I got a letter saying, you need to come in for a meeting at the bank. And they were trying to give me a credit card. And I was like, I'm on the fucking dole. I can't have a credit card. And they were like, no, it might be good with your finances. And they were literally saying you should get a credit card, which was nuts. So yeah, that was Lloyd's, who actually recently got fined 28 million for serious failings towards bonus schemes. And they got in a lot of trouble for tax evasion as well. So you know your money's in good hands. Also here, this used to be a pub called The Hole in the Wall. And I can't remember why it was called The Hole in the Wall. I wonder if there was a uh, cash machine there. Because you know a lot of people say, oh, the hole in the wall for the cash machine. If anyone remembers if there was a cash machine where the old hole in the wall pub was. They turned that pub, it was a great pub. They turned the top into some like mansion sort of, uh, what do you call it? What's that top floor of a, a place called? Oh, you know the word, the top, the top gaff and the block of flats. Anyway, it's like ridiculous. It looks like some Hollywood-esque pad. It's like, who's going to live there? I don't know, to be fair, there is a lot of wealthy people around Hebden. But it was a good pub. Penthouse, that's it. Penthouse. There we have it as well. Some boarded up property, two boarded up properties next to each other in Hebden Bridge. The tourist town that's prosperous and you've still got boarded up properties. One of those recently had some squatters move into it and I went in to chat to them because they kind of opened it up and I was actually interested. I thought it had made a really good film but they got evicted before I could get around to doing it. But yeah, these squatters moved in and I thought, fair play if there's an abandoned property and uh, what are you doing? And I went in and I said, oh, so, so why are you doing this? What motivated you to do it? And one of them went, astral projections, man. And I thought, oh, fuck off. And just over here we have the other bank which is gone, which was the Barclays, the Barclays Bank, which had a cash machine as well, gone. And it is now the Afghan rug shop. So yeah, that was Barclays there, which closed down in 2018 in Hebden. And it's now the Afghan rug shop. And Barclays calls themselves a British Universal Bank. And in the past 20 years, they've got done for gold price fixing, fixed rate scandals, and tax avoidance. So another good one there. So how many is that we've seen that have gone in this town? Three banks. We had the Lloyds, we had the NatWest, we had the, the Barclays there, and we had one, two, three, four cash machines alongside them that are gone. Now there are cash machines that's still in the town, there are a couple, but one's always not working. And it's the same with Todd, where I'm gonna go look at now. Um, where there's some banks, again, that have been turned into other things, just down the road. I heard a great analogy by a guy called Brett Scott, who really understands all the stuff about cashless society, really interesting. So yeah, this Brett Scott guy says that cash is like a bicycle, a bike. You own it, it's yours. You can use it wherever you want, you're in charge of it, you can see it, it's there. Now, digital currency is like an Uber. Again, it's reliable, it's really handy, at times you can use it a lot, um, it's safe and it's quick as well, it's really quick to use an Uber, it's, it's really handy. But now imagine the situation where your bike gets taken off you, you're no longer allowed to use your bike. Now, you're completely reliant on the Uber. Now that doesn't sound as good anymore, does it? When you're completely reliant on this Uber, who is controlled by a private company, and they could just up their prices whenever they want. Things can go wrong with the Uber. There's so much there. And when that happens, you might start to think, ah, I missed my bike. My bike was good, but I can't ride my bike anymore. And I think that's a really good way of looking at it. A really good way of looking at it. So yeah, Brett Scott, really interesting guy. Yeah, I'm not saying that digital currency isn't great. It really is great. It's so handy. It's so effective. It's so useful. It's quick. Like when was the last time that you put your pin in? Contactless just suddenly came about and it took over. So quick to do stuff. It's great. But I also want to have my bike there in case I need it. I want to be able to use that, use my cash. So some real examples now of what can happen when we when we give up cash and we give up our power to these big corporations and essentially the government who can control your finances. And that's happening now. Justin Trudeau, the, the Prime Minister of Canada, 
he froze the bank accounts of a load of truckers who were protesting um, vaccine mandates in Canada. He froze their bank accounts. He stopped them having the ability to access their cash. Again, this isn't some sort of conspiracy theory around cashless society. This happened recently. They could not access their money. They could not do anything because they were protesting. That decision should not be in the hands of the state. The decision to use your cash is yours. In China as well at the moment, they are operating off a social credit system which essentially rewards good behaviour and punishes bad behaviour. To say if you're caught on CCTV at night acting drunk and silly, you can be punished by not having access to your cash or other things. I don't know how serious it is and I don't know the levels of it, but essentially that is what it is. If you act good and you behave well, you will be able to access your cash and do things. But if you misbehave, we'll punish you by stopping you have access to money and being able to do things, which is just nuts. So recently in China as well, there've been a lot of protests against the government. And what a lot of people have been doing who are attending these protests They've been going to the, the train stations and buying the tickets in cash. They've been buying the tickets in cash, there's, so there's no electronic trail linking them of going to this place where the protests happen. Because if that did happen, if they could say, oh, we know you went to this protest, then they could be punished through the social credit system. So that's the importance of cash as well. It means you have the right to do things like protest anonymously. That's really important. So with these electronic money trails that come with paying through digital payments, it does allow big corporations, big tech firms to, to harvest your data and to know exactly what you're spending your money on, what you like to eat, what you like to drink. And it doesn't even matter that if you can go, oh, well, I'm not, I'm not doing anything wrong, so I don't need to worry about what I'm spending my money on. But, but at the same time, look, if you want to go out and you want to buy a 10 inch dildo, you should be able to do that without someone knowing that data, someone having that information on you. I'm not bought a 10 inch dildo. I'm just saying, if you wanted to, honestly, I didn't buy it. Cash just gives you that freedom to spend anonymously and just do things and pay people and pay for services and not leave that trail, which is just a nice thing. It's a nice way to operate. It's not nice knowing that everything you do is traced, everything's recorded, everything's put down, regardless if you're doing good things or bad things or not. It's just, it's just weird thinking about, isn't it? Everything is traced. And obviously it's useful for catching criminals and all that, but just for your day-to-day -day people, the regular people, just knowing everything's been traced isn't nice. And that doesn't happen with cash. With cash, you can't trace anything. You can, you can live freely. A guy at work said it nicely, he said, cash, it's the last bastion of freedom. Right, so I've just got to Todmorden, the town that's just a couple of miles down the road from Hebden, where I spend a lot of time as well. And I know that there's a bank that's recently closed down as well and become something else. So we'll go have a look at that. And there's also, in Tommerdon, the only bank in the Calder Valley, from this stretch of the Calder Valley, from here to Brighouse, it has the only remaining bank, a Halifax. So we'll take a look at that and see what the opening hours are. Because I don't think they're open much either. So we'll go have a look at that. So I used to work in a pub not a while back. And when we got tips, when it was in cash, it was great. You get given some money, you put it in the jar, you could see it building up, it was there, it was nice, and then it was split between us. But when we got card tips, it was taxed. So the money was added onto your wage and then you were taxed, which just kind of made that gesture, just a nice gesture. Someone's felt like they've had good service. They've given you a bit of money and you can just enjoy it. Once you've gone through that process of taxing that money, it just takes something away from it a little bit. So I always said to people, I said, look, if you've had good service and you're gonna leave a tip, we much prefer cash tips. It just makes so much difference. But having worked in the hospitality sector for quite a number of years now through different jobs, I have massively noticed uh, the drop of people giving tips since it's moved to card, do you know what I mean? Like, people are just less inclined to. If you've got some coins in your pocket, you've had good service, you know, oh, that's great, chuck it over. But with card, it's just that extra step and it just, just means that people, yeah, people are tipping less. Another thing as well that a cashless society causes a massive problem for is homeless people who operate off the generosity of people, who live off the generosity of people who are able to just to give a bit of change to them. And I know in Sweden or somewhere, which is like leading the way for cashless society, they're saying, oh, homeless people can now process card payments. There's an app which means homeless people can process card payments. But it's that sort of momentary instinct of good human nature that says, oh, I've got a few coins here, I'll give that over to you. And that's, that's gonna be really helpful to that person. And a card transaction, just adding in them extra steps is gonna put that on the decline for sure, for sure. And I think the bank's around here. Right, yeah, there it is. And here we go, the old bank on the corner. And now this bank, which is uh, part of the buildings I still think up for sale, 
but part of it has been um, changed into a pizza place. And unlike Hebden, where they said, where they called it coin or the vault, a memory of the past. Look what they've called it here. You can just see up there as well, TSB. This was a Lloyd TSB building that is now a Domino's. Now a Domino's. It's come to top and taken over the old bank. But this place here still got its name bank on it. Let's have a look. What a building. And it says up there, established 1859. So this was the big old bank. And part of it's now a Domino's. Cash machine would have been there. Cash machine would have been there. Very useful. So I got told as well by someone that there was another place that was a bank. It's now called Honest John's. It's again, bar and restaurant. So let's go have a look at the building and see if there's any uh, history of it being a bank on it. Yeah, there it is, the Honest John, which was a bank. I've forgotten which one. I can't remember which bank it was. Do you know what bank the Honest John was in Todmorden a few years ago? Please let me know. There's a generational change of attitude as well towards money and I've literally seen it like I've seen a bunch of kids come out of a shop they've bought some they've been given some pennies back in change or whatever and they've just chucked it on the street they just don't care whereas the other side you've got people like my dad who's buzzing when he finds 20p and he texts me he goes oh I found 20p so that just sort of different attitude towards money one with just thinking what's the point in this with the other one really realizing the actual value of cash there's something strange as well about virtual money sort of being easier to play with like in the past when I've had jobs and I've been paying cash, I've been pretty good at sort of putting aside what I need and, and, and spending what I can spend, but also like keeping what I actually need. And I think it's something to do with seeing the money and feeling the money. It's quite a visceral thing, knowing exactly how much is in front of you. You can see how much you're spending. Whereas with virtual money, just a number on a screen, it kind of just doesn't have that much meaning. So you can sort of lose significance towards it and then just spend it and think, ah, oh, fuck it, it doesn't make any difference, just spend a little bit more. And I've been really bad in the past at times as well with sort of getting things on finance and falling into a bit of a bad trap with that at times where like I've had no money in my bank account, literally skin, and then I thought, oh, there's a nice pair of shoes, oh, I can buy, shall I buy them? And then it's gone, oh, you can pay in three, pay with Klarna, pay in three. I'm thinking, oh, I could just do that. Don't, don't worry about it now, you can't afford it now. You can, but future you can worry about that and deal with that. And I fall into it bad at times with things like shoes on finance. Yeah, it's strange. Trying to not do that anymore, get things on finance. But that sort of virtual world, that virtual currency, is sort of easier to pay with. It's like we're actually just playing with debt. We now just deal in debt. I'll, I can have that and I'll just give you a bit of my debt for the future. Right, so let's go have a look at the, the last bank in this area. The last bank that's uh, still around that you can go to. It's a Halifax bank. Yeah, I just turned up at Halifax bank. Uh, what time is it? Three o'clock on a Tuesday and the shut. Yeah, so case in point. I bet they sat somewhere going, oh, you know, the footfall in these banks just isn't enough. We'll have to shut them down, no one's coming. Well, maybe if you fucking open them a little bit, open them at some good times, people will come. Yeah, so I checked in that, that Halifax bank that opened nine till three weekdays uh, with a lunch break. Nine till three. Who the fuck's going to the bank at nine till three? Do they not know when people work? So there we go, a little look round at what the banks have become and where the cash machines have gone. A little chat about cash in the society as well. I've completely changed my opinion on it. I realise the and understand the value of keeping cash and hope maybe that you've uh, seen something in this that makes you think that way as well. You know, cash is important. Hello. Hey. Look at this guy. Cash is important. It keeps the power with us, the consumer, and doesn't let big companies just do what they want and massively profiteer, which is what will happen if we give up complete control of, of cash. As I say, look at your energy bills. Look, look what they can just do if they go, oh, we want to keep profit the same. You know, cash is great for rewarding people, like a tip, like when you work somewhere or you want to say, oh, you've done some good work here and you give a five pound tip to someone, like in a restaurant. It's good for giving like your nephew 10 pounds in a birthday card or something like that. And as I say, it's great for homeless people just to be able to use that cash. And the guy don't need this, but I can pass it on easily. There's so many reasons, way more than just them, but they're just a few. And I think as well, it's about reframing that idea of a cashless society. And this is what that Brett Scott, the guy who I mentioned before says, he says like, you know, where they're trying to get, everyone's doing initiatives to get old people who are struggling with, with going digital. Like we need to convert them to the cashless society. And that's not the way of looking at it. Of course, we need to help those people be able to use 
digital currencies, but doesn't mean we have to get rid of cash. In, instead of calling it a cashless society, we should be calling it a digital bank dominated society. And, and instead of saying, oh, these people need to come join us on this side where we only use digital currency, we need to say, no, it's totally acceptable to use cash. You shouldn't feel ashamed for using cash. When someone pulls out cash, that should be accepted and encouraged, and it should be a good thing to do to pull out and want to pay with cash. It's an important thing. So whilst planning this film, I kept thinking about a book, The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck. It's one of my favourite books. Uh, it's about these families in America who, who get their homes taken off them by the bank and they have to leave and they have to move west towards the coast, sold on the dream of picking oranges in this ideal place. And it just wasn't the case at all. But there's this whole aspect of the book which, which talks about the bank as like a faceless monster, an uncontrollable faceless monster. So I'm going to finish the film today with a bit of a reading from The Grapes of Wrath by John Steinbeck talking about the bank. So this book was written in 1939, but it seems pretty relevant and seems to sum up the film I've just made quite nicely. The bank, or company, needs, wants, insists, must have, as though the bank or company were a monster, with thought and feeling which had ensnared them. The banks were machines and masters all at the same time, the monster has to have profits all the time. It can't wait, it'll die. Those creatures don't breathe air, don't eat side meat. They breathe profit. They eat the interest on money. If they don't get it, they die. The way you die without air, without side meat. When the monster stops growing, it dies. It can't stay one size. The bank is something else than man, I tell you. It's the monster. Man made it but they can't control it.